Okay, thank you very much. So thank you everyone for joining. Today is uh, the DSC community call and we have a special guest, which is Michael. Michael sent me some information and said, hey, would you like to look at that? And I say, I'd love to, but I won't have time. But there's the DSC community call next week. So why you don't like, why not presenting it and then telling me a little bit what it's about. So Michael, can you just start maybe? I will let you, I will leave you about 30 minutes and then you can present your project, your big project. Let's put it like this. And then see how our fight gets us. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, just give me a sec, sorry. I literally, um, okay. Um, I'm, I'm not I can give you have any slides. I'm not gonna do any slides. So I'm just gonna, it's gonna be a yeah. bit more of a show and tell. Um, so one of, um, one of the things that um, I've been working on for um, a little bit of time is um, we've been able to actually um, update the um, Azure DevOps um, decides to take configuration resource, um, which um, at the moment it's currently only supports PAT to PAT tokens. So one of the things that I wanted to be able to do initially was um, be able to update that to support more modern um, authentication mechanisms. Um, but then basically what's kind of happened and it'll take you along the journey is that, um, it was a bit of a requirement that we needed to just kind of set and say, Hey, we want to be able to run this in the pipeline. Um, not necessarily specifically targeting a machine, but it just kind of needs to be able to be, um, a pipeline object that we can use. <coughs> so that kind of, um, yeah, that, that kind of changed a bit of the processes there. So um, what what that meant for us was that, hey, um, we can use a machine. You can still use, um, you know, an LCMB one. Um, and we're kind of looking at that. And then I kind of thought at the end of the day, though, um, it's good. Um, I don't think it's there. Um, I, I didn't really think it was um, out, out there to achieve what I wanted to achieve. So. Um, and there's other features that I think that potentially can um, be, we could take advantage of, which could, could um, potentially make it a little bit easier for us to manage in the future when we run in our pipelines. Um, so essentially what we, what it came to was, hey, let's write an LCM. So obviously we have access to um, V2 now, which we can then use um, JSON files or YAML files, um, things like that to be able to actually ingest. Um, and then we can kind of, start to have a bit more um 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 a, a, little, a little bit more fun around what we what can what can we actually do with an lcm so um sorry i'm just being completely distracted i'm just trying to start my agent build machine which um is always um it's just one of those things i forgot to do this morning so all right so let me just go ahead and share my screen um and we'll just kind of go a little bit of journey. i don't really want to i'm not going to really spend too much time in the code because i know that um that's not particularly going to be very conducive to a good presentation um and it's unless you guys want to see some code i think what the only thing i'm really going to kind of talk about is more the lcm side um so what kind of transpired is that i effect we've effectively rewrote um, I would say we wrote, I, I forked the um, Azure DevOps DSC resource and then basically refactored a lot of the logic. So the underlying resource logic within it, um, uh, for instance, your PAT tokens, any sort of authenticator was actually bound directly into um, the resource, which um, from a managed identity perspective or any sort of modern authentication perspective, it kind of, like I understand what's what's been trying to done there, but at the end of the day, though, it's like, hey, we should have to just do this once um, at the beginning of um, the LCM run. When we invoke our LCM, we should just be able to say, hey, authenticated measure, you know, whatever authenticator, you know, type, whether it's you know, PAT tokens, whatever, just do it once. Um, we shouldn't have to be able to repeat that in the configuration. So, um, so one of the things was that within the resource itself was that we added, I added managed identity. Um, abstracted out the PAT tokens and then effectively created a separate authentication class so that it's effectively now um, the way that it works is that you can um, let me just I'll just go to my, um, the readme.md um, um, you, you effectively can just call it prior to the LCM execution so um, 
message. Um, so for instance, you can um, within here, um, you essentially call the command, which is called um, you know, Azure DevOps Authentication Provider. Um, and then the idea is that we can expand on that um, rather than actually having it embedded in the resource and then effectively it's responsible for managing everything. The idea then is then you can you know, import our modules, um, create our identity token, and then from that, we can just basically use and make a C resource, you know, to be able to actually run what resource we want to run. So when it came down to the LCM, what we wanted to do was we're just like, all right, let's just use invoke DSC resource um, and we'll basically build an LCM on, on top of that. So um, to be able to kind of detect changes, you know, so on and so forth. Um, so what we've done there is um, this is kind of um, the LCM here. Um, and essentially the way that it kind of functions, it's actually, I've borrowed a lot of technology from different people. Um, so essentially it's based off datum. Um, so a lot of the fundamental logic is still based off datum here. So if we have a look at an example configuration, um, it still uses datum. Um, and so we're still following that hierarchical data structure management. Um, but on top of that though, what we're doing is we've actually broken it down um, a little bit differently. So instead of having, um, you know, just resources and um, configuration kind of all meshed together in a single file, what I've um, what we've done is we've basically broken it down into parameters, variables, and resources. So it's kind of a little bit more like an Ansible playbook. Um, and then essentially what we did is we started to um, conceptualize, okay, these are our resources. We're going to basically structure it pretty much, you know, very similar to how um, your this traditional resources are with your name, you know, with the type. Um, and then basically start to build the technology around, for instance, dependencies and, um, you know, um, dependency formatting, things like that. Um, and then from that, we can then start to go, all right, well, then let's start adding conditional logic. We can then start doing, you know, string um, expansion within that, um, within the LCM. You obviously can do string expansion within the, uh, within datum. So you kind of got pre and post, very similar to how Azure DevOps does its um, um, variable interpolation as well as that you can do pre-execution nodes um, by compilation and then at the time of execution. Um, so it can do very similar things to that. Um, and then essentially what we did was we went, okay, um, how can we expand on this even further? Um, and we started looking at other things like, for instance, post-execution. So um, once a task has been run, we can then run logic to say, okay, do you want to continue to run um, LCM logic? So for instance, you might have um, datum configuration, you get, you know, let's say for instance, we've got our, um, you know, we've got a blue here, a blue.yaml, which is effectively a, a project. Um, and what we're basically, you can see here, there's actually no, it's just a file with a couple of variables and that's about it. Um, the rest of it effectively for the project is, is it's all just interpolated within the, um, at the time of compilation. Um, so the idea here is, is that we can then go, all right, you've got our project, we've got our name, and then effectively, you know, we can just have this as a generic resource that, you know, can be reused across the, um, across Azure DevOps. But what we want to say is that basically within here, we can say, all right, you know, if obviously it's absent, um, we don't particularly want it to exist. Um, there's no point running any other resources or, you know, any continuing the LCM, um, we can then basically say, hey, stop. Um, so uh, things like that, there, there's other things that we kind of was thinking about and putting in the pipeline, uh, or putting in the project, basically considering things like, you know, um, um, kind of more of a um, tentative, um, like, and, and, you know, Gail, you kind of had it as more of a change window um, type um, LCM set method. Um, so very, very similar kind of thing there where basically um, we can actually set, but it'd be per resource. So you'd be able to set a, um, effectively a, um, 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 a, uh, a delay window for a specific resource. So if you introduce new resources into a pipeline, you want to be able to audit that capability. Um, you can say, all right, you know, that specific resource can wait seven days before it's going to deploy. So you can do things like that, where we're basically starting to think about, all right, you know, there's not necessarily a black and white in terms of administrator um, management, especially when you're talking about large, you know, complex um, implementations. There's a little bit more nuanced and gray, sort of like, okay, well, let's actually 
we can put it in um, and then basically put a time frame on when it will be applied. So it just means that we can get feedback. And the reason why is so, like a really good example for this is get tag, um, not get tags, but work work item tags with the National DevOps. So I know um, the business gets very excited about this. Personally, I just think that people need to have you know better team processes in place. But the idea is is that you can then say, all right, I write a git tagging resource. Use some special logic within there. So it's not just you know culling the spell things. It's trying to go. Oh, maybe it's this. Okay, I'll just kind of rename that tag to you know this. So if you've got misspelled items or things like that, it kind of you can kind of correct them and keep everything everybody nice and happy. But the problem with tags is that, you know, if you wanted to implement a tagging policy in place and then just say, all right, and next thing you know, then you've got a ton of developers, you know, even if you have a change window, the impact is too great. Um, even if you scope it down to smaller projects, so on and so forth, it's just, it's one of those things that it can, yeah. Um, one of the other things which we're really excited about is introduce actually composite resources into it, um, which would actually work fairly well. Um, and the other thing which um, I've, I've also um, kind of uh, hit the chicken and the egg scenario is, is that there are some resources that actually have to run post um, datum execution. So datum is really good for, um, you know, organizational level down, which, you know, essentially is pretty much how we should be applying things. But Azure DevOps is um, somewhat a little bit broken in that sense where, for instance, if you want to set um, let's say you want to set process policies, um, our project processes, um, that's basically set at the organizational level, but the thing is the process, the project has to exist and then the groups have to exist. So you, it's, it, um, if you want to set an organizational level policy, it has to be per project, which is really, really silly. So what I'm actually looking at doing is effectively, um, like group policy look back, which essentially is a, um, the way it works is that it'll take all the compiled datum files um, once this resource block is, you'd essentially be a resource block and then effectively it does a filter, figures out which, um, which, uh, um, which uh, for instance, YAML files or project files are the same and then basically group those resources um, together and then be able to execute that. So there's, there's, there's some other interesting things that kind of help get around it. Um, but the big thing here is, is that we kind of designed it. Um, I know it kind of breaks best practices, but I feel like there's um, where it is hierarchical in nature. So you can basically say, all right, I want to be able to scale um, multiple, you know, multiple things with um, datum or alternatively, if you just feel like you can't be bothered doing that and you just want a single file, um, you, it does permit the ability to do that. And so there's a lot of capability um, and nuance within it. So for instance, you can see here that um, you can do native code execution within the, 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 the YAML file. It's not ideal, but at the end of the day though, it's just a means to be able to ensure that, you know, there's plenty of flexibility within there so that if there's a business case that does come up that potentially doesn't align with datum um, directly, is that we then be able to actually account a cost for that. So. Um, you can see a great example, and I've kind of used the project and project services as a great example because um, these two resources, because essentially what I've done is that project um, .yaml file is effectively abstracted out into, um, it's actually abstracted to a higher level. So you're not actually defining the project and the project services, that's actually done at a um, at a higher level within datum. And then effectively what I'm just doing is just doing some variable substitution and interpolation at time of execution. Um, and then basically, um, you know, essentially having some um, logic structured around it to be able to actually ensure that it meets what we want it to be able to do. Um, so that's pretty much um, what it looks like. Um, what we've got happening here um, is, if we just jump into my pipelines, this is what happens when you don't have your um, Azure tools turned on. Um, but essentially, um, I've essentially just got a, um, I, oh, hang on, let me just quickly jump into my files. So you can see in here, essentially, this is just um, the repository for the configuration. Um, you can see here, we've got our projects, the present you know, governance configuration. Again, very, very low level. And then what I've put in here is I've got some policies in place um, saying that, okay, we've mandated that, um, there are multiple, um, we need to code um, every um, project that gets created. It's a bad demo, but 
kind of um, we can mandate that basically you know every project that gets created there needs to be a code configuration um, git repository associated with that and then what we can do within here is that basically we can go all right um, let's go ahead and do that so if we you know we can create a repository and then we just basically add that code repository so within here I actually did have um, an airhead moment in the pipeline yesterday where I was like, why the hell is this thing not setting? And I'm looking at the, like the, the, the logic. I was actually writing a bug um, to myself to um, go and investigate. And then I realized that project name and repository name were actually the wrong way around. I'm like, it, it's trying to find a, it's trying to find code configuration as a project. And I'm like, yeah, no, I know it doesn't exist. So um, yeah, but the idea is, is that, yeah, you can see here, we could set that. Um, and then within here, we can then also set our permissions. And one of the other big things was that we needed from an RBAC perspective um, is Azure DevOps is not as granular as what we would like. Um, so what effectively we did was um, we've kind of been working quite closely, building out a software development lifecycle, building out, um, you know, role-based access control. Um, what does that look like? How are we going to govern that? Um, so one of the key things there was that we had a, um, um, so we've essentially created a whole bunch of different RBAC groups. And you can see here, they're just defined as variables. Um, we can then just basically um, go ahead and create those groups, like, you know, essentially just a resource. Um, and then um, once that's all completed, then we can actually start setting our resources uh, or setting our permissions. And the one thing you can notice here, especially with the depends on it does support, it's an array. So essentially what you can do is you can give it, you know, as much as you want or as little as you want. So it's not having to kind of have this orchestration based approach. You can basically say, no, it depends on this, 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 and this. Um, if you don't want, like for instance, I technically wouldn't need to need the project, but it's just, you know, it, I think I think in some sense it depends on also it acts as a bit of documentation and helps, I, I, helps the person online and understand what actually is um, the pre, not necessarily the pre requirements, but what's actually kind of um, run prior as well. So you can see in here, basically what we've done is that, yeah, you can, I've got a resource in here. Um, we've got the properties, again, it's just, you know, these are resource properties. Um, we've got our permissions are basically, um, and effectively, yeah, you can see here, so identity is set by permission, what can, what it can be set, what can't set. Um, and then I'll quickly just show you what it actually looks like in action. Um, so you can see here, if we jump down into repositories, um, you can see it has applied it. Um, we can then just basically go into security and you can see here, it's actually gone through and applied our security permissions, um, set our permissions that we needed for those specific RBAC roles. So yeah, nice and standard, quick and easy. Um, yeah, consistent. Um, one of the final things I quickly, I'm just going to jump back into a little bit of code, not too much. Um, one of the things that I did within the LCM to kind of help um, make it work um, a little easier um, is I abstracted out a lot of the um, the, the kind of the, um, these kinds of rules where you, you know you want to add something. So for instance, if you want to format um, your your resources a specific way, if you want to do something you know within the LCM, the idea is is that um, it's not perfect. I've still got to, I've still, I need to conceptualize it a little bit more, but the idea is that we can actually abstract out um, those things into just separate scripts. And effectively what you do is you just pass in a, um, you know, essentially just your resource pipeline resources into it, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Um, you can, you know, do variable substitution, so on and so forth. So, and what I have in here is just that basically, um, you know, and a good example is we've got pre-parsing. So, um, Oh, sorry, we'll do, we'll do the first one, which is sort depends on. So that's basically exactly what it is. It's essentially looking at, you know, all the depends on, figuring out where every, what tasks need to go where, and then reordering in the entire list um, to, to accommodate that. Um, this makes it really easy to test as well. So from a testing perspective, now you've obviously, you know, best practices to abstract it out, but now you've actually just got a single, you know, piece of code that you can run it as many times as you want. It makes it very, very easy to test and find the bugs and these kinds of things. Um, again, it's the same thing for like circular references. So we're looking for, you know, essentially you know, any sort of circular references um, within that. Um, and then finally, the one of the final things that it does, it does, um, it does actually go through and looks at the properties um, for each of the resources, make sure that the resource actually exists. So essentially it's doing some pre-parsing checking 
um, making sure that you know the property values and things like that are, are, are working correctly. Um, it does have some reporting capabilities as well. It's not great. Um, I can definitely say that it's not great. Um, but the idea is that moving forward, I will expand on. That's one of the, the key things that I want to expand on is reporting. Um, the, the, I'll just quickly show you a previous run so that you kind of see what it looks like. So what I have currently set up here in this pipeline is, is that basically there's a, um, I've just got a two cron jobs running. Um, where one of them is basically just running um, during business hours, which is just running periodically every hour to test the configuration state. Um, and then outside of business hours, it'll actually start enforcing it. It's not perfect. I think it probably needs just to run. Um, it, there, needs, there could be some other uh, variants within that. But um, the idea there is that that's pretty much it. And essentially here, you can see here, it's just importing the module, parameterizing the inputs and then um, invoking the LCM. Um, I did have to do some changes because one of the things I realized is that data collection rules don't work on um, CSV files. Um, so I had to go and take the reporting. The reporting's broken. I would say it's broken, but it's just not great. So I'll quickly fire up. I'll um, show the output of a job. So this is recently just one of the jobs that's just run. You can see here, um, um, effectively, we can, we can kind of get a nice little output. It kind of tells you where the CSV file is, and then you can kind of see what um, what's within spec and what's out of spec. So um, yeah, it's, it's yeah, and it, and it basically will perform it for each thing. So you can see here, you know, with a project, this is a um, for the Magenta CSV file, which effectively doesn't um, that project is in the absent. Um, so because it's absent, it doesn't necessarily need to invoke the rest of the task. So it'll give it you a skip. Um, in the reporting file, I'd actually tell you why it's skipped. Um, I would give you a demo of. DSC compliance reporting, but essentially what it is, is just forwarding all that data into log analytics, which you can, you know, use some, um, you can use some additional um, custo to kind of create those nice graphs and, you know, be able to understand compliance reporting and things like that. So, yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll stop talking if you guys have any quick questions. Apologies, I missed quite a fair bit uh, towards the end, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I had an issue with my uh, headset and then I've lost uh, the sound so I could see but I couldn't hear anything, but it's just uh, towards the end. Does anyone have a question? And then feel free to just unmute and ask the question before I start. No one? Um, oh, I forgot. Um, so if, if you do want to have a look at it, um, I'll quickly paste it in the um, chat. So, you know, it is on um, GitHub. Let me just see if I can actually get to my GitHub. Um... Found it already. So um, is it easy to use this concept also for non-Azure DevOps tasks? So does it support <laughs> all the resources that we have currently available? That's actually a really good question. Um, I went for a run the other day and I thought about this. Um, no, not at the moment. However, um, this LCM hypothetically could. Um, so because it's it's so tightly, uh, it's effectively, the, the big problem at the moment is that it's the authentication provider. The authentication provider is effectively tightly coupled to um, Azure DevOps. Um, However, if you decoupled that, abstracted it out, and you know, effectively wrote a, um, um, a, a the idea is that you write an authentication provider for, um, and there would need to be some other um, magic happening in there. But essentially, you need to abstract that out, and then basically, what you could say is that um, you have two options: you can either use the resources authentication class, or, authen or alternatively, or oh, sorry, or authentication class if they have one or however means they use that authentication, or alternatively, you can just write your own. Um, so if you're basically wanting to, you know, um, connect to a specific machine using PowerShell remoting, you know, some of those things, or you want to have like, um, you know, for instance, a whole bunch of, um, you know, secrets that you need to be able to go grab so that, you know, there might be things that it needs to go and jump on different remoting machines and things like that. You would effectively define that at the top level um, but the thing is, is that you wouldn't be passing those secrets in. Well, the way I would be doing it is I'd either be nominating from a pipeline perspective, I'd be nominating it from T-Vault, so or some sort of authentication provider. And so essentially, it just means that you know, from a 
from a you know authentication perspective, no physical secrets are actually being presented um, within the pipeline at all. It's either it's all abstracted out. So, but yeah, hypothetically, it can be done. Mm -hmm. can, can you you said uh, if I remember you mentioned that it supports uh, composite resources. Uh, no, so when I mean yes, yeah, so I'm wanting to write composite resources, composite resource support. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it yet. So when I'm, it might, it's not going to be pro, it's not going to be DSC composite resources. It's going to be um, a different kind of way of approaching it. Um, not entirely sure how I'm going to approach that yet. Um, yeah, but uh, the way the way that I'm kind of envisaging it um, is that because composite resources are effectively just, um, it's just a bundle of resources. Um, because the LCM, at the end of the day though, the LCM shouldn't really care about what goes into it. It only cares about realistically, because it, um, if it, because it only cares if you write a composite resource, um, yeah, um, the composite resource should just be uh, effectively a parameterized um, YAML file. Um, realistically, so essentially it says, okay, you know, here's your parameters, here's your, um, you know, thing. You can probably put some base logic in, in that, um, and then effectively you can make that a composite resource. And then what you would then do is that that would then be, um, uh, um, you would probably maybe have a composite um, configuration directory um, where effectively what it can do is that when it senses that, you know, you could. Uh, yeah, again, I'm just kind of um, hypothetically um, just kind of um, speculating here, but the idea is that then you'd be able to then go, all right, um, this is a composite. And you, when you, when you write, like when you write that specific resource, you could say, all right, this is a resource. It's a composite resource type. And then it goes, okay, it's a composite resource. Go and look in this directory for that YAML file. Go and grab that YAML file and effectively go, all right, this is parameterized. Pass those parameters in. Make sure that this, um, it works. Um, and then basically, you know, let the let the LCM do do its thing. That that's kind of how I envisage it, the envisage it, but it's um yeah yeah yeah. So yes, because I was I was intrigued because um yeah you can drop that in the oh it's already in there sorry yeah I'm um, sorry, yeah um, I know I'm um, poor Ryan um, I I feel so sorry for Ryan at the moment because he's the poor guy that has to actually look at the um oh I think he's back now he hasn't so. Uh, um, he he's the, the um, he's got to do code review on the um, um, on the um, the resource refactor and obviously on the actual DSC Azure DevOps resource and there's mm. a lot of like as, I did write a few extra resources in there there's there's, I mean, there's only a couple but um, there's so, a lot of work that's kind of gone into it. Just just a note for everyone when there's a PR with 480 files that have changed. Usually, reviewers don't really like that because <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah, huge I, change. It's not. It's not. A, and the thing is, this is on like you know, it's it's a, uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I kind of feel I felt sorry for Ryan. I was like, I'm fourth it, and I'm like, ah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I think so. I think um, Ryan. Yeah, I feel really sorry for Ryan. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, yeah. There's maybe a lot. Like, maybe there. I should just. Maybe I should just. Um, the other. The other option is that just basically make it a completely different resource. Um, we just call hmm. it. I don't know something really random like pop tarts. <laughs> 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 but yeah. Um, yeah. It's um, not not great. But um, yeah. All right. Is there any other question? I have a few. I have a couple. Um, so you are using just uh, normal DSC resources, and then you're just using them through your YAML files, and then you're just invoking them in sequence, just basic, like, let's do this one, let's do the next one, based on your YAML files. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So, um, so that means if you want to add and remove projects, you just create a new YAML. That's your new project. Like you add blue, you can have another one, and then you can just instantiate like this a new uh, um, Azure DevOps projects, and then you can configure them. In how long does it take to run them through like a project and do the configurations that you have? Um, at the moment, it's again I need to do some more optimization um, to create a new project. It's about one minute, uh, one to yeah. two minutes. I do need to improve. 
um, the caching um, process. So the caching process on the resource is not great. Like it, um, and there needs to be some improved logic within there, um, within the caching. But at the end of the day, though, um, yeah, you kind of, unfortunately, you kind of beholden to the API calls. Unfortunately, so yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not like it's not like it takes hours. <laughs> It yeah, takes, no, it's, 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 not about, take it's about minutes. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's okay. about minutes. Um, it's even faster when it comes to testing because the way that the caching mechanism works. So essentially, it's not great again. Um, but the idea with the caching mechanism is it's just basically um, when there's this when when the resource runs, um, it effectively goes. All right, I'm just going to cache. You know, all the projects, all the security namespaces, all the ACLs. Um, essentially, grab as much as I possibly can and just bring it down locally. So I'm limiting those API calls. I'm doing large amounts of API calls at the beginning, um, but then that just significantly improves the capability for you know your, your continual continual testing. So yeah, it testing's a lot quicker. So pipelines. So for instance, it'll take about a minute um, to maybe maybe two minutes to perform tests um, against mm -hmm. the project. Um, but that again, it really varies. Um, but at the end of the day, though. Um, yeah, I, I would say it's yeah. You're not talking hours here. We're talking minutes. And uh, do you use this in production? Not yet. No, I've still um, I've still got to I've still got to um jump a lot of um hoops um at the moment where we've kind of yeah it, it's 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 all the it's um uh, the the tech stuff's easy now. It's all the going through all the business processes and um you know chatting with business about you know all the different features and things like that. But from a um, from my perspective, um, of after demoing it to the business, the business loves it. They're like, "Hey, you know, from from a consultancy point of view, they're just like, hey, if we can go to an organization and say, you know, if we want to put Azure DevOps in, you know, as a greenfield, even as a, um, we can then go, this, you know, this is how we go. Yeah. We can just standardize it as a bit of like a landing zone. Um, the the other the other yeah the I, one of the big things I really do want to do is approach a more of a brownfield site. So existing users, you know, we're talking 2,000 users, um, bad, bad design, and then be able to go, all right, this is how we're going to, you know, achieve it, um, and slowly start to actually um, use it in that environment. I think that'll, yeah, that's where they, I think that the um, the cost savings are going to be immense. It's not necessarily in the greenfields; it's going to be the brownfields. And what's your coverage for like all the features that you want to set in Azure DevOps? Like, do you think you pretty much got at least 80% of what you want? Or do you think like you're about 40, 50% of coverage of what you can actually configure? Um, for, for myself, I'm not even close. Um, feature coverage, what I want to do is automate everything. No, no, uh, I'm talking about Azure DevOps, the Azure DevOps uh, settings that you want to change. Like just this this part, you know, the coverage of the resources and what you can do and what do you, you want to do. Like code coverage testing or code coverage. No, like... it's like you can set up projects, you can set up like different elements and and you know you have oh, the resources yeah, to no, do this. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've, <laughs> I've, so there are so many other things I want to do. So the one so at the moment, um, in terms of the the biggest hurdle that I had, and it's one of the reasons I, I did get um repository permissions, um in Azure DevOps is because of um, ACLs. So understanding how Azure DevOps manages this um, permissions is actually key um, to build out the rest of it. So from my perspective, we're more focused on permissions and basically segregation of duties, role-based access control. That's really where we're focusing on. That being said, you can't basically have, for instance, um, you know, a, you can't have um, a, uh, um, a, for instance, an Azure DevOps um, work work item, um, or, sorry, uh, an area being created. You need to have, like, if you want to set permissions on an area, you need to be able to create the area first. So it's kind of that, you know, you still need to have governance around that. So, but the permissions factor um, was actually really, was really important because essentially I had to write a lot, there was a lot of logic to be able to actually, one, um, Download and understand the security namespace. I could probably do a deep dive talk at, <laughs> at Pierce Coffee again yeah, on how <laughs> the security namespaces and like it works under the hood because it's very, very fascinating. But essentially, you have to write a ton of serialization components to it um, to make that to make that work. And that was really the the key foundational work that needed to be put in prior to actually expanding out the other resources. 
Which is a great transition to the little advertisement I'm going to make. Uh, the <laughs> uh, you call for it. So the uh, the the PowerShell and DevOps Summit in the US has the CFP open until uh, we've got two more days, I believe. It's until the 15th of November, and PS Confu is still open until uh, mid December. So, so yes, please go uh, find the links. I don't have it at hand right now. I will post the one for PS Confu very soon. But uh, please submit your talks and and deep dives into how you configure through PowerShell. Uh, you know, Azure DevOps is definitely the kind of talks that could be very useful. And then you know how that works, or how the mechanics behind you know Azure DevOps and what the things you need to do to be able to manage authentication. That's definitely a good subject. Mm. Sorry, you asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> is there is there any question any further question uh, for Michael? Uh, thank you very much, by the way, because I looked at uh, your clock on your computer. And it's like about six a.m. when when you started, <laughs> I believe, and I didn't realize. I thought it was about seven or eight. I thought, yeah, that's okay. We can ask him to come there. But at I, six a.m. Yeah, up by the cat at four thirty. <laughs> I was not happy. I was not okay. happy. Oh well. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed for this presentation, and I hope the project goes well. Um, I'm yes, it's interesting. I think you should do like a bit more design, you know, like PowerPoint stuff to explain a little bit how the LCM works, and you know the how the uh, maybe the layers you know, that you have in your data objects works, and and is in I, I the do, boat. I do actually. I do have a PowerPoint. I'm just like I don't like PowerPoints. Um, <laughs> no, it it's more about diagrams. It's more about the diagrams of like when we do this there, then this depends on then yeah. you know. Yeah, because it's hard um, to follow the flow. Yeah, I I explained. I was explaining to um uh well actually when I work because that's yeah to you know put together a PowerPoint for the business um and I've got yeah trying to explain and again it's you know I'm trying to come from the um not from the technical side but from the business side and trying to explain from what what datum is, you know, that's, that's really <laughs> tricky. And so I literally um, put together a, a nice little animation in PowerPoint that does all the merging and data and then it, the, like a little box falls down into the LCM and it translates it into API calls and then the compliance <laughs> reporting gets sent off. And it's just so, it's, uh, yeah, I'm like, oh, that, and, and it, it's terrible, but that's like the most of my UX like design <laughs> yeah. capability put for that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. anyway. I can relate to that. But yeah, no, otherwise, very, very interesting. And thank you very much. And, and I think, yeah, it's a different way. Not that, you know, I wrote Datum, not probably the way I would have expected it to be used. But uh, but the way I've created Datum was like, it needs to be just about the data and Datum should not understand anything about DSC. And then you can use and abuse Datum the way you want for your configuration and then whatever data layering you want to do. And then you still use it in a different way, but still use data in a DSC context. I, I found that funny. And thank you for that. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I don't have any subject. There's a few news. Like um, we were mentioning that Raymond is working on protected data, which actually, Michael, that might be of use to you as well if you use data. Uh, because protected data is, what is it, Raymond? I'm not going to do your job. Come on. <laughs> it's us. for encrypting, decrypting strings, especially in datum. So, so it's, it's just for encrypting, decrypting stuff using certificates or a passphrase. So passphrase comes quite handy if you are for testing. And this is what Gail picked up a couple of years ago, six, seven years ago, maybe, for datum. Well, it's a long time ago, so right? So we have a we have a datum handler pretty similar to what Michael um, said about these dynamic variables, these pretty weird x equals something syntax. So we have a, another syntax in datum that indicates that this is a secure string that was encrypted, and this gets passed to protected data for decryption. So this module was only working on PowerShell 5 until recently, and uh, we managed to port it to PowerShell 7. Everything works, but if Gail would be a bit more faster setting up the release pipelines, it would have released it since long time. But <laughs> no, that's not even true. But it, it, the only <laughs> truth in there is I'm not very fast, but uh, I'm trying my yeah. best. Yeah. So and we were. So, um, 
Now, just just for the history lessons, uh, it was uh, if you know uh, Dave Wyatt, uh, who used to be in the DSC community a little bit, he used to be very much like in in the PowerShell community, and he's been doing amazing work. And I believe that one was written before 2016, which means PowerShell was not you know cross platform, and then PowerShell seven or even PowerShell six was not even there at the time, and it was using, if I remember correctly, and tell me if I'm wrong, it was using um, .NET APIs, which were not ported at the beginning to uh, the new versions of .NET, and then uh, that has changed over time. No, 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 um, no they are, they're still not, not ported. So we had to find a different... So I think in the code, we are switching between um, .NET Framework, .NET Core, because the APIs are looking a bit differently. Yeah. Yeah, but, so that's why that's why I needed some work. And uh, Raymond says I'm happy to do the work, but because it was uh, Dave Wyatt that was owning this module, obviously, but he was not maintaining it because he didn't do that anymore. We kindly asked, hey, do you mind giving it over to the DSC community so then we can, you know, update the code and publish it? And now it's a DSC uh, community project. And as soon as uh, Raymond and I can work it through. We will start releasing the new versions and um, yeah. add this uh, PowerShell 7 uh, supported. And thank you, Raymond, for the work because I'm just trying to put the keys in the right place and I'm not very fast at doing this. Um, um, uh, sp speaking about modules, um, one question. PS depends. PS depends is another thing that is not maintained at all and seems to be very important because we use it in almost any project. So yeah. have you guys heard about plans to kind of put it somewhere, continue the maintain, maintenance? I think I had the discussion with uh, Warren because Warren wrote that module a long time ago. And I think one day he said, hey, maybe, maybe you want to, you know, take it and maintain it. And I think my reaction was, no, 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 no. I have too many things to maintain already that I don't want another one. Um, and I don't know if uh, I don't know if PS depend PS depend was really good because of uh, and we're still using to this day. That's what Sampler used, so everyone yeah. and in the DC community use. Um, it well actually we yes we're using it, but we also have bypassed it with uh, module fast, and then also doing like some other things uh, with uh, PS resource get. But but we can still use PS depend. So. It's a great tool, but if we were to start or to maintain it or to start from scratch, what would we do? And that's a very okay. good question. And, yeah, and yeah, it sure. looks like Raymond, you have a lot of spare time, so maybe you yeah, should, of course. Uh, but Gail, I, I didn't, I didn't follow the the evolutions in Sampler recently. So, do you say that PSD Pen was replaced by PS, PS get resource get and by use module fast, or is it still a, a, a key component? So we don't necessarily. We do, so when you configure module fast, for instance, I don't think we use PSD pen at all. We just okay. we just read we just read actually the um, the PSD one file, the required modules of PSD one, and then we execute that uh, through uh, module fast. Ah, okay. So we just kept the formatting and the configuration files, but that's it. Yes, but it's just okay. an option. And then module fast, like there's some challenges with module fast in some cases. So, um, okay. so, so yes, I, I believe maybe you told me actually when um, when your module versions is not uh, semantic versioning or stuff like that. Yeah, uh, module fast has got some troubles. Yeah, yeah, it, it's known there is an issue already, and um, I'm missing the name. Justin, 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 Justin has a view on it. Yeah, perfect. Um, yes. So, so yes. Yeah, so that's the story. And uh, for PS resource get, I can't remember if we just look at the configuration file, or if we use, or if we don't use the PS pen. Honestly, I don't remember. But yeah. And one other question. Uh, recently, I got in trouble with PowerShell YAML more and more often, and well, I found another. Yeah. That must be between the keyboard and the chair. <laughs> uh, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, one thing is the depth parameter. There is no depth parameter for serialization. And there is another module called YAML. Has anybody made experiences with that? Thumbs up? It's the, it's the best. OK, so 
It's jo- Jordan uh, wrote uh, that one, yeah, Emil. And, uh, and it's really good and it's got a lot of features and he's oh, really yeah, actively yes, yes, maintaining yes, yes. it. I know. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. It's very good. It okay, should so be in the talking... official sample, Gail. <laughs> Sorry, say again? It should be in the official oh, yeah. uh, sample uh, instead of the PowerShell YAML. Yeah, really? Are you, are you changing it? Switching to YAML? I was already switched to Yaya Yamo, but it's not in the sampler yet. Uh, okay. No, it's it's not. Because no, in sampler it, it's it, not used. But... It, it, it has some bugs. I tried it, but is it bugs or is it because so because uh, PowerShell YAML was doing some stuff differently? I probably there's a I know they're doing some different stuff in the um, serialization and I think one of the issue at least on my side is I haven't spent enough time on the AML to have to be confident to port everything I do but one day this will happen at least for the stuff I do um, sampler probably will take a little bit more time just because uh, there's a lot of YAML no no yeah. there's like yeah the, Maybe. So we used it for some very um, complex data for, what was it uh, here, AD Zoom rules. And uh, PowerShell YAML didn't cope with the complexity and the it was just a very easy change. Just a different, uh, yeah, a different module prefix and it worked right away. So I guess even changing sampler should be quite easy. Well, see. Well, see. <laughs> yeah. we, we need time. And as you know, time is... Uh, it's hard to find these days. Yeah, you should do less vacation game. <laughs> and you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, but that would be yeah, that would be interesting. So, without further ado, I think. Uh, so I'm just checking on the chat, but just just tell us you want to do a, a demo on Doc Generator for class based DC resource. Is that correct? Well, I was just yeah. yeah, I was just. Curious if uh, because I asked Jim after the uh, mini con, uh, mini con when he was uh, presenting the new uh, party PS redesign <clears throat> if there is a possibility to um, uh, document classes or DSC resource classes and he told like well there isn't really an option right mm-hmm. has anyone got any experience with it with what with the classes or uh, with well, with, docu- uh, with documenting with PS. the with documenting DSC resource classes in so an automated Johan was, way. I think Johan did some work on this, but I can't remember how far I got. And then I know someone else did something in the community because I believe I remember something like that at uh, PS Configure, but I can't remember okay. from the top of my head. But uh, it we we nearing the end. I would say that would be a great subject for the next session um, yeah sounds very interesting yeah if yeah, you can i think to that yeah i've been uh hopefully i can make it in the next community call but i was just playing around in the wink at dc repository and i was repeating myself constantly when generating some documentation so i got so annoyed. yeah I- on this case, like the next DSC community call, because it's over six weeks, that's probably going to take us around Christmas time. So there won't be one. But I know they have, uh, there are quite a few user groups and sometimes virtual user groups that exist. And uh, I would probably send you a link so then you can submit the talk for one of the user groups. I help with the uh, with a couple of user groups, so I can probably put you in touch with them. Let's put it like this. If that sounds interesting, we can have a session at that time. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. I think, Raymond, you can stop the recording. And thank you for coming. Oh, yeah, that's the Winget DSC. Yeah, I just put it in.